Hi, I'm Joanna Fortune, psychotherapist and author of the 15 Minute Parenting series. My 15 Minute Parenting series comes across three volumes, the first of which is about zero to seven years, covering those early childhood years and everything that comes in there. And then I, my second book is actually the eight to 12 years volume because I really felt that middle childhood is that stage of our children's development and of course that stage of our parenting development that is the most under discussed and yet it is a time of huge growth and change for our children. So I really wanted to spotlight and give a whole volume over to middle childhood, those eight to 12 years. And then my most recent book is the teenage years where I take my 15 minute parenting model and I grow it up in line with our children's growing up so that play is still possible and that creative communication becomes a part of our relationship and nurturing that connection between us and our teenagers at a time when play and relationships in general really do change. But across all of that, I'm talking about how our children change across the trajectory of childhood. Of course, how they feel about us also changes. Initially, our younger children are completely in love with us. They think we are just fantastic. We have all of the answers. They come to us with our questions. They trust what we tell them. We are their number one. We are their important hub of social development where they draw everything from us. In middle childhood, they're becoming a little more cynical about us. They still come to us with their questions, but now they might doubt us. You might have your nine-year-olds ask you a question, you give an answer, and this time the response is, are you sure? Should we check that on Google? So they're beginning to go, you might not know it all. Actually, I'm beginning to pull away from you in middle childhood and see that my peer group is my important hub of social development and where I'm going to move oh, they know everything, I'll check with my friends. And then comes adolescence, when they're not just cynical about us, they are outright disappointed in us. So they go from being in love with us as small children to being really disappointed in us in adolescence. They see us as not having a clue, being out of touch, you wouldn't get it, what would you know? Those kinds of dismissive, minimizing phrases. And while that's actually, you know, it's unpleasant, it is entirely normal for our children's development. And we do expect and want to see our children grow and develop over the course of their childhood into adolescence and young adulthood. What's really important and what will actually carry us through all of that is if we can grow our parenting up in line with our children's growing up. What, mean, what that means is that the strategies that we found really successful when we were parenting our five and six year olds may not be effective in middle childhood and we may actually have to change how we do things to elicit the same response and the same outcome. And in adolescence, we have to redefine those boundaries and limits all over again. What's really important and what will keep us grounded as we negotiate all of those stages of parenting with our children is if we can embrace the motto that good enough is good enough. Because do you know what it really is? If you are getting it mostly right most of the time, that's good enough. We will all have good days and bad days within our parenting. That's unavoidable. But what is not good enough is perfection. And I think in you know parenting in the digital age and that pressure of the social media glossy veneer that we can perceive other people are doing it so-called perfectly, that's something that we really have to call out. Because when I say perfection isn't good enough, it's because if things are perfect, then there's no room for mistakes. And if there's no room for mistakes, then there isn't any room for growth and development either. And people are about growing. We have to grow within ourselves as people. We have to evolve within our parenting. And by doing so and modeling it so imperfectly, we give our children permission to embrace mistakes and learn from them as well as they grow and develop. I cannot think of a better gift that we could give our children than that. So yeah, have your whoopsie moments, get it wrong, embrace getting it wrong and go back and make good. What I call, when I uh, say that in, the, in my books, I talk about this quite a bit, I call it rupture and repair because our life is about those, isn't it? Like we're kind of out of sync and then there are moments where we're trying to get back into sync and find that shared rhythm again. And sometimes we have different tempos, different things are going on for us and we react to things in our life. Our children might say and do something, initially we let it go, they do it again, they do it again, they get louder, they get louder, they get louder, and all of a sudden we snap. So what you see is by the time 
you snap at your children, it's no longer because of what they're doing. It's because of what was getting aroused in you and triggered in you and activated in you by what they were doing. That's about us. Now, you notice I'm saying when that happens because that is going to happen. We are, we're all going to snap and lose it and have our less than fine parenting moments. We might yell, we might bang something, we might say, oh, out of here, do something else, go to your rooms. And our children are, you know, they get that shocked expression. They're like, what's wrong with you? And they might be distressed or they might then come at us and we're into a bit of a row about it as well. What's really important is in taking that time apart, look, I need to cool down, that actually you use it to think about what's gone on, what happened there, what got activated in me when my children were doing or saying what they were doing. Why did I snap? What was it today that was different from other days when this happens all the time and I let it go? Why not today? That's about going inwards to parent outwards. Once you've had that time to self-regulate, to come back into what we call that window of tolerance where our emotional arousal just feels much more comfortable. When you're there, you go back to your children, you come down to their level and you say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I lost my temper, my feelings got really big inside me and they came out in a really loud shouty voice. And I think I might have frightened you. I kind of frightened myself a bit, but now I feel much calmer because I thought about it and I want to say I'm sorry. Our children are so forgiving of us and, and our transgressions. They're gonna let you off the hook. But in again, in going to them and saying, I got it wrong, I've thought about it, I've been able to make sense of my feelings, and I'm sorry, I now want to connect with you again. We are also teaching our children how they can get it wrong, how they can lose their tempers, and how they can make a repair in their important relationships. That's a fantastic life lesson, and it's something that we really should embrace, that rupture and repair. A key part of everything I'm talking about here in, in addressing positive parenting, I, lo I love this phrase, positive parenting, because it kind of says everything and nothing. You go, gosh, that sounds great. I'd love to be a positive parent. What does that mean? In order to parent positively, we have to be able to feel positively about ourselves. That is our parenting selves and our non-parenting selves, because we're more than our kids' parents. We were people before them, and we're going to need that to carry us through. In my first book, the Zero to Seven Years book, um, the first couple of chapters that I've written are about preparing for parenthood. It's about childproofing your relationship. And within those chapters, I have also included something I call the parental uh, self-audit. That is exactly what I just said reflecting inwards to parent outwards. I focus on it quite a bit in this book, but I do make reference to it in the other books simply because it's not supposed to be a one-off thing that we do. This is this self-audit is supposed to be something we go back to time and again and that we draw meaning from and that we deepen our understanding of our parenting selves as we grow. Always remember, there is no better way to discover your own unresolved issues than to become a parent. Our children will bring our stuff screaming to the surface, stuff you didn't even know you had to think about, and all of a sudden it's going to pop out of your mouth. So it's good to get curious about where that might come from. I'm going to read to you a couple of questions from the parental self-audit, as I do, because I'm never a fan of just asking questions of ourselves. I think it's equally important that we pause and answer those questions. So as I ask you this, you know, just some of the questions, I'm not going to do the whole thing right now that would be far too long for this video, but Take pause and answer the questions as they apply to you. What was growing up like for you in your family? In what ways was your relationship with your mother similar to and different from your relationship with your father? How were you disciplined as a child and how did that make you feel at the time? How does thinking about that now make you feel? How does how you were disciplined line up with how you now conduct discipline in your own family. Who played with you as a child? Do you have memories of your parents playing with you or singing to you or dancing with you? Can you recall a specific time that that happened? And just take a pause now and bring that story to your mind. How did it feel when your parents played with or sang to you? Or if they didn't play with you or sing to you, how does that feel for you now? And how might it have felt for you when you were younger? 
Did you ever lose someone important to you through death, moving away, separation? Who was this person and what was their role in your life? How were successes celebrated in your family? And how were disappointments managed in your family? Did you have important adults in your life outside of your immediate family, your, your own parents, outside of them? Who were those adults? And what was that relationship like for you? What would happen if you were sick, the kind of sick that you have to take a day off school? What would happen typically at home? Where would you stay in bed? Would you lie on the sofa? Who would take care of you? What would happen? And what would happen if you hurt yourself? You know the kind of hurt yourself if you're out playing and you fall and you cut your knee and it needs attention. Can you bring to mind a time that that happened in your childhood and who took care of you and how did that make you feel? When I move you on from the self-audit piece towards the parts of your non-parenting self, what I ask you to do and what I'm now asking you guys to do watching this is to bring to mind or write down a list of five things that bring you pleasure in your life. So these should be things that are about you, not about your children, not about parenting your children, but about you. So five things that bring you joy and bring you pleasure in your life. These could be anything, look, it's going to be different for all of us, but they might include things like swimming, running, book club, um, going for a walk, painting, arts and crafts, yoga, a massage, a hot towel shave, um, a manicure, a night away with your partner, a night away on your own. Something like that that brings you pleasure. And once you have a few things in mind, and if you struggle for five, go with what you have got, but maybe give some consideration to building some more of these opportunities into your life. But bring to mind, like, when is the last time you got to do any of those five things? Do you get to do something? You might not get to do all five, but do you get to do something for yourself, of yourself, just about you? every single week. If not, how long is it since you did get to do something like that? And now what needs to change in your life, in your schedule, to make sure that you can put yourself first? I think children are a really, really important part of our lives, should we choose to have them. I really do. I think they're very special. I think the relationship between a parent and child is a fantastic one. It grows, it changes, it bends, it adapts, and mostly it survives and thrives within all of that. That being said, I don't think that children should be the only important thing in your life. You're important. And if we are to focus on positive parenting and parenting from a positive place, don't we need to nurture ourselves so that we have that top up our own love cup, if you like, so that we can tend to our children and top up their love cup by responding to their needs and demands and wants and wishes and everything that children bring with them in that constancy of demand um, that comes with parenting, as well as the joy and laughter, but there's always things to do for other people. What I'm trying to talk to you about is that if you really want to think about positive parenting, start by being positive about yourself. Start by investing in yourself. And not only is that going to be good for you because you're going to be parenting your children from a much more content, calm, contained, relaxed place, but actually you're modeling really good self-care for your children. You are showing them that you have a life outside of them. And I think that takes a lot of pressure off our children, actually. They mightn't thank us for it at the time. I'm not, I'm not naive about that. They mightn't go, oh, you're going out again? Is it all about you? Good for you, mom, or good for you, dad. They're not going to do that. But actually, later in life, when they realize that you showed them that it's important to have things that are about us and our desire, that bring us joy and pleasure, and that they keep us balanced, they're learning from us, they take their cues from us, they take their emotional lead from us, and they certainly take their beh behavioral actions and those cues from us as well. So do yourself a favor, and also doing your kids a favor. Take time out for yourself. Find out about your parenting, what makes you tick, what gets you kind of reacting, what keeps you reflecting. When are you at your happiest, most content parenting self? Go inwards to parent outwards, and around that as an archway, the scaffolding that's going to keep it all together, make sure that you find and take time for yourself, yourself and your partner, but also for yourself. Show your children that you know how to have fun because that's going to also make them want to come to you and see you 
as a place of pleasure and joy. So I'm basically giving you not only permission, but a strong nudge of encouragement to get out there and put yourself first. Start with one thing every single week that you have one thing that is just for you and then grow and build it from there.